Welcome back to day three, the implementation track. I am your host, Dr. Damon Durker. I am director of optometric services at Eye Surgeons of Indiana. I'm live here in Indianapolis, and I cannot wait to get this session started, get our uh, morning rocking and rolling here in the dry eye space. So I'd like to introduce our next session, which is going to be Ask Us Anything. Dry eye disease experts answer your burning questions. And I'm pleased to introduce our esteemed faculty for this, um, not really so much a presentation, but a conversation. I have Dr. Cynthia Matosian and Dr. Leslie O'Dell. Cynthia, Leslie, welcome to Eyes on Dry Eye. Excited to have you. You guys excited to answer some questions about uh, dry eye disease? Can't wait. Yeah, thanks so much, Damon, for having us. Uh, briefly, Cynthia, to start, you know, tell us a little bit about your uh, practice and why dry eye is such a focus for you. I'm Cynthia Matosian. We have offices in two states, Eastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey, and we go back and forth across the Delaware River, actually not far from where Washington crossed the Delaware on Christmas Day to attack the British. It's a historic area, and my area of specialty within ophthalmology is refractive cataract surgery. In order to get the outcomes that my patients and I were kind of counting on, I backed into the ocular surface and dry eye space because I realized the importance of having that stable tear film, which Leslie and I will talk about shortly in order to get the outcomes that we had planned on. So as a result, I have become an expert in dry eye ocular surface and more than happy to share some of those pearls with all of you. So keep your questions coming. Leslie? Well, I actually started my um, passion and, and desire to really learn about dry eye in a refractive practice as well, um, because I was doing all of the post-operative care for a surgeon in um, York County and learned a lot about the 2020 unhappy patient after cataract surgery. Uh, and this goes back to the days where we only had um, cyclosporin to treat dry eye and maybe punctal plugs. But um, now I am in a medical optometric practice in um, York County, Pennsylvania. And I will tell you that dry eye has, uh, we opened our doors in January of 2021. <clears throat> and without dry eye, I'm pretty sure I maybe would have had to close my doors six months in, but dry eye has been about 50% of my patient exam. So I often say, you know, you are doing your patients a disservice without identifying and treating dry eye, but really you're doing your, your business of, you know, your optometric business or your surgical business also a um, detriment because if we're not identifying this, we're, you're not helping yourself or the patient. I agree completely. And we're going to get right into it. We have, um, you know, a couple of questions that were submitted beforehand. And this one is going to open up a lot of conversation. So I'm, I'm excited is everybody wants to know, they, they go to Eyes on Dry Eye, they go to conferences, they talk to their peers. And the question that comes up so much is where do I start? And Leslie, if you wanna you know, kind of start rolling with that for a doctor that wants to get into this space and do more or maybe develop a dry eye clinic or dry eye center, where do they actually start? Um, I think I heard um, Dr. Shepard say this once, which is it's dry eye until proven otherwise. And so I just think you start where you already have started with patients in the exam chair. And then you just build your skill set to identify and look for it, whether the patient is complaining or not. You're really trying to develop this proactive approach, I think, to dry eye. Um, so I really look at every patient as a potential dry eye patient until I do my exam and realize that, you know, maybe they really don't have any ocular surface stressors or disruption to the homeostasis of the tear film. You know, Leslie, I agree with you. And a lot of it depends on the eye care provider's mindset. My recommendation would be get your mindset that you are going to start looking for dry eye disease. Just like Leslie said, you don't have to advertise for these patients. They're already in your practices, in your exam rooms. 
Secondly, get your staff involved, your front desk receptionists, your billing folks, because there might be some um, cash or other billable services that they may need to know about coding and get your technicians involved because it takes a team to treat dry eye disease. Once that is established and do some training for your staff, start basic, start on what is dry eye disease and just start there. The anatomy of tear film, meibomian glands, on and on. And then go into like one step at a time. And Leslie and I will delve into that in a moment. Where do you start? Maybe just by doing a questionnaire, do a simple one, like a speed. OSDI is a little bit more time consuming and start there or do the one where you just like circle where you are between one and 10, you put an X or a, or a check mark. And this way you can assess the level of discomfort the patient is experiencing and move on from there. Implementing that dry eye questionnaire is so important. I've learned that, you know, with Damon over the years as well. And so this was the first practice that I really could come in and put my own spin on versus fitting into practices where there were other providers there already. And so we do that. We do a, a speed questionnaire on every patient. And then when I have a dry eye patient coming back, I use a speed, but maybe ask a few other questions, but I have a speed questionnaire that I do for everybody. And then for me, for me I really do rely heavily on point of care testing um, as my first step in with patients. So my speed my speed questionnaire helps prompt a standing order to then allow for my technician to perform tear film osmolarity and inflammatory testing ahead of me, you know, seeing the patient. I think one thing, you know, one thing that doctors I think get worried about is time, right? Time management. And once they open the door to dry eye, they may never get to the next patient. <laughs> I think that's really <laughs> one of the concerns. But I think what you said, Cynthia, about delegate and train and empower your staff takes a huge load off the doctor. You don't need to be spending all of the time educating patients. And you'll find that your technicians actually take great pride in having those dialogues with patients. They want to educate them. They want to help um, the patient understand the treatments that you're providing and the value of those treatments. So that really offloads a lot of time for me. But when testing doesn't get done, as I have in this standing order, it actually is more disruptive to my schedule is when I have to, you know, go back and redo something because my exam isn't making sense. Um, so I think that questionnaires are really key because patients might not say dry eye, right? And those questionnaires really help you identify people that might be having eye fatigue or, you know, just blurring of their vision throughout the work day that you might not have known about. I very much agree with um, what you're saying, Leslie, and my approach is the same thing. And for doctors who say, we don't have time to do the questionnaire in our office. And that's real, that's for sure, because you know you need a clipboard, you need a pen, you need patients to return it to you, then you might have to scan it into the EMR for the speed questionnaire to become a permanent part of that patient's electronic medical records. You can do this online. There are very easy ways right now, especially with the pandemic, so much of telehealth has opened up. Some of my colleagues do the preliminary dry eye consult via telehealth. You can schedule that at a mutually convenient time, run through the questionnaire, get all that information, be uh, paid for your time. And then when the patient comes in, you're already that far along. You can even task this to a technician, a physician's uh, assistant. It doesn't have to be an MD or an OD who necessarily does this as long as it's under your auspices. Then you have the basic information, or it can be via a bi-directional 
a communication format, something like MD backline, where you send a questionnaire to the patient, the patient fills it and returns them back to you, and it becomes part of the record. So then, just like Leslie, I have my technicians do three things, tear osmolarity, MMP9 testing, and mybography. To me, those three pieces are key to get started in dry eye. I say that's where you should start in addition to the questionnaire, because now you have um, tear film homeostasis information via tear osmolarity. You have inflammation information via the MMP9, and you have architectural information about the meibomian glands via the mybography. And with those three components, you will be able to educate your patient as to what they have and initiate a customized treatment. So you're doing the speed you're doing point of care diagnostics in both tier lab and Quidel with osmolarity and inflamma dry there in the exhibit hall. What mybographers are you uh, using in, in your practice right now? Leslie, do you wanna go first? Sure, I have used um, almost all of them over the years. Um, so I was part of um, the first version of tier science. And so as Lip of You became able to do mybography, I, I really actually like the Lip of You system. Um, it does very high quality imaging. I've also used LipaScan. And actually with this practice, it's my first time um, utilizing the Oculus Keratograph. And I've really enjoyed um, just the whole layout of this crystal tear report that my dry eye patients, when I'm bringing them back for what it's called an initial dry eye exam, again, my point of care testing is there, but I do run them through this crystal tear report through the Oculus. Um, and that's been really great. I kind of grade it alongside the patient and educate them as I'm doing that. And then it will even do a printout that you can give to a referring doctor or your patient. And it, it, it's really nice. And then I also actually still have my, um, my box. So if for some reason my biography wasn't done in my pretest room, I have that ability to do it in the exam room. Um, I like that one because I, I feel a little bit more confident in my ability to do superior gland imaging with my box, just because it's at the slit lamp um, where you're naturally, you know, kind of more comfortable doing Liddy version. But uh, I know it, you can do it on all of the systems. So my right now is Oculus, Keratograph, and uh, my box. I um, started with a lip of you back in the day. And like Leslie said, it can give very clear images. And the black and white, and I call them piano keys because patients relate to that. By looking at these images, they, even if they're not, um, have even if they have no science background at all, most people can look at a normal versus an abnormal uh, image and immediately detect that their glands have shrunken, dropped out, are architecturally abnormal. So lip of view is my go-to. We also have a lip of scan in one of our satellite offices, but recently there's a new entree in the market from IMED. They have a desktop unit that can do eight different dry eye tests all in a matter of eight to 10 minutes. And like Leslie said, with a uh, Oculus, this one also does a report and it gives you a very specific percentage and color codes them into green meaning normal, yellow, orange, and red, and red being abnormal. So it can give you a percentage of meibomian gland dropout, for example. It can give you other scores as well. So you can use that not only to initiate therapy, but print it out, give it to the patient, that's their report, share it with a referring physician and track those results over time to see whether the treatment that you have initiated is effective or whether the patient is actually being compliant with whatever it is that you've asked them to do. So all of these are options. And it doesn't mean you have to try them all, but at a big meeting, go, go to the booth, spend time at all of these and figure out which one is the best mybographer that works in your practice. 
And what was this called, Cynthia? Um, it's called IMED. It's like the letter I dash M E D. It's a Canadian company that has just started their entree in the U.S. Brent Jones and Michelle Schnabel are the two who are kind of the lead, um, like VP of marketing and business development um, in the U.S. And they are here at the exhibit as well at this meeting. Yep, you can go ahead and open a separate tab. Tier Science has got the lipid view, lip to scan, and uh, IMED doesn't have a booth, but they have a con you can get their contact information and, and get uh, some information about uh, the suite that Cynthia uh, mentioned that does all of those different tests. I'm going to go to a couple attendee questions. We were talking about the upper lids, um, Leslie, with uh, diagnostic um, imaging of that. But Matthew wants to know, what's the best tool for meibomian gland expression? And maybe I can add on to that as both a, a diagnostic expression and a therapeutic, because I think those are two different things. And Leslie, if you want to tackle that first, and then we'll see what Cynthia has to say. Well, it's always you know, a great question. And I think starting with diagnostic is very important. I have adopted the practice of using the meibomian gland evaluator on my initial evaluations. And I actually do that on every patient that walks through the door. Um, that was originally developed by Dr. Korb as a tool to deliver the same amount of pressure to the meibomian glands as the blink to really understand what is happening with the meibomian glands under physiological settings of your patients, you know, daily tasks and just blinking. Um, and so that is different than me using a cotton swab um, to push against the glands because that pressure is variable between myself per patient and also between, you know, provider to provider. Um, I though, if I have a low score, on my meibomian gland evaluator, I do have um, a catena expressor that is a very small foot plate, meaning it's really only targeting one gland at a time. Some of the other versions of meibomian gland expressor um, tools, they have a little bit of a wider foot plate, so you might be getting three or four glands at a time, which is great if you've done a warming technique and you're pushing out my bum, but I, I first used this smaller Katina um, expressor just for a diagnostic. Um, if I don't see anything moving, I want to push just to see, I call that cold expression. Can I force, you know, my bum out of the glands or is there more of an obstructive event? And then when I think about when I go to treatments, it depends on what I'm doing. Um, with Lipiflow, I know there is some evidence recently that showed post-treatment expression was gaining more uh, of, a, of a treatment effect. I, I actually did that early on in my Lipiflow days, um, and now I've come away from it just out of where my treatment room is. Um, so with Lipiflow, I really just let the machine kind of do my obstruction um, and clearing. With IPL, um, I've also seen some conflicting, um, you know, do you really have to do expression after IPL or not? Um, I do. Um, and with that, I use, um, I use a little bit of a broader expressor. Um, and I honestly don't know the name of that one. So I do apologize there. But what's nice, I mean, I've even bought a few off of Amazon just to play around with different tools that are, you know, lower cost um, to the doctor. Um, the big thing that I did um, is, and, and sometimes I see this when I go into different clinics, is we invested in um, an autoclave, you know, I think that's a big important thing now if you're doing any treatment on a patient and you're using any expressor that you have a way to thoroughly clean. Um, and so we now, all of our stainless steel goes through autoclave, you know, like all of your surgical tools do as well. Um, so I think that's one of the other changes that I've made. But I, I would just say, you know, getting comfortable with even just expressing, right? It's a little bit awkward um, at the slit lamp at times, and you you have to really position your slit lamp and yourself, and um, you don't want to be too um, cumbersome to the patient. The worst thing I find is if my expressor slips off of the lid margin. I mean, that induces a little bit of pain for patients. Otherwise, they tolerate the procedure quite well. Dr. Matosian, um, what are you doing for 
diagnostic and therapeutic expression in your practice? I use the um, meibomian gland evaluator as well. It's very small, it's lightweight. I keep it in my pocket of my lab coat. And because you get consistent amount of pressure, over time, once you start doing it over and over and over again with every patient, there's no pain whatsoever to the patient. You get a better understanding of the quality of the mybum, the color of the mybum, the inspissation rate. You really learn the language of these mybomian glands. Um, in terms of treatment, after a lipo flow, I typically don't express, like Leslie, I let the machine do what it does because it, of course, heats and then um, automatically through these gentle pulse-like movements evacuates the inspissated glands. If I do other procedures such as ILOX, it automatically expresses the gland by moving the device across the lower or upper eyelid. Tear care has its own paddle that comes with it. And that's from Psych Sciences. And after heating the glands for 15 minutes, you can express with a wider paddle. I have found that it's less, dis there's less discomfort for the patient once the glands have been heated to express them. I don't try to cold express glands because to me, you really have to push hard and it's not worth the amount of discomfort I'm kind of um, providing to my patient. It's so much better to express after heating if it's done for therapeutic reasons. And um, with other devices, let's say an IPL, in the past, I used to manually express with the newer IPL models, I have found that you don't need to. I have a luminous myself and I stopped um, expressing after the procedure, but some doctors do. And I think sometimes that jump starts the symptomatic relief for the patients. Is there any tool that you feel is better than the others for expressing the upper lid in particular? That was a question from Stanley. You know, I mean, upper lids are just, I find always a little bit more uncomfortable for patients. Um, but all of these same, you know, expressor tools that we're talking about, I think we would use on the upper lid. It's just a little bit, a little bit more uncomfortable um, for the patient. And I, I think that we like to do expression just for morbid curiosity sometimes. You know, in my IPL patients, I'm doing it um, after some of the sessions uh, because I just want, I'm curious to see where I am in my treatment. But I know with science tells me I don't have to do it, but um, talk about adding time to your day maybe it's something I should stop doing <laughs> uh, but I think sometimes, it's just curiosity yes and sometimes for the upper lid if it's hard to get a stainless steel spatula up under the lid what I do is I take a sterile cotton tip applicator I soak the cotton um, part with topical anesthetic drops. I put a few drops of anesthetic in the eye. Then I place the cotton swab under the upper lid and use my thumb to express across the upper lid. I find that is more forgiving than a metal spatula across the upper lid. Whereas the lower lid, I more comfortably use a metal spatula. So not surprising now, we've got just the questions rolling in. And you know, one I'll answer right away easily is my bony and gland evaluator, which you both mentioned, the manufacturer of that is Tier Science, uh, Johnson & Johnson. You can find them in the exhibit hall. Uh, we got your answer on this, uh, at least a partial answer, Dr. Matosian. But Ariel wants to know, if you are just starting out and you don't have a thermal pulsation device, do you recommend cold expression to help treat or is cool expression only for diagnostics? Leslie, you want to take that one and then anything else you want to add, uh, Cynthia, you can do so. Well, when I mentioned the cold expression, it was just as a diagnostic um, and it is uncomfortable. You know, obviously you're not warming the mybum. You have to put more force there to release anything. And I only do that if my mybomian gland evaluating score is zero, no glands functioning. I just am wanting to make sure, you, you know, sometimes I've had patients that have been on Accutane therapy that I... I physically can push really hard and nothing is coming out. They might be a patient that I want to 
pants off to do a probing event, you know, a probing treatment prior to um, an in-office treatment. Very rare that that is the case in, in my practice, but um, you definitely need to be heating the mybum. So I think there's ways that you can do that without having a device, but you know, I did those when there wasn't devices available. So prior to LipaFlow, we would use heat masks that were available at the time. Um, what I was doing at that time in 2011 was tranquilize um, XL masks by iEco. I would warm up the MyBum using this heat mask that could provide heat for 15 to 20 minutes, and then I would, um, you know, push on the lid. And, and gosh, I don't even think there was really a device available for pushing. So I probably was rolling a cotton tip on the outside of the eyelid at that time. Um, but, you know, we do have heat masks that you might be able to modify a treatment, but I think the cost of entry now is, you know, really worth your practice to invest in technology. I know tear care has made it very easy to get an expression device in your practice. I know Ilux has also done that. You know, really, I think investing in a technology is is essential if you're, you know, treating um, meibomian glands. And even the price point for something like a lipoflow compared to ten years ago is uh, I mean, absolutely. down quite a bit. So, I think one of the takeaways from a lot of our sessions is you got to find something there to express the glands if you really want to take dry eye seriously in the practice. Any other comments on that, Dr. Matosian? Um, I believe that you have to heat before you do um, therapeutic expression. Otherwise, the amount of force that you may have to put on the glands, of course, depending on the co context and the texture of the mybum, may be too much and you could cause a crush injury of the mybomian glands. So heat first. If you don't have anything, do a heated mask. I used to use the heated brooder mask, actually. We had a dedicated microwave for that. We'd heat it for 20 seconds, put it on the patient's eye, and then the patient would purchase that mask um, because we weren't reusing the same mask for every patient. And then I would do the manual expression after the heating. But now with all of these different options, and modalities that we've talked about, the entry into the market is much more reasonable financially. And all of these companies want to work with you um, to provide these treatment opportunities for your patients. Great, uh, good stuff there. Um, lots of questions, I'm just gonna go straight through them. You know, uh, is tear breakup time and tests to identify quality of tears still important in the diagnosis of dry eye disease? I still think that it's very important. I, I feel like tear breakup time is one of my first clues to loss of homeostasis of the tear film. Uh, you know, and I am using now technology that allows for non-invasive tear breakup time, but I still do rely heavily on my fluorescein breakup time. I use it too because fluorescein is already on the ocular surface. It doesn't take another device, another piece of equipment to measure it. Of course, it is somewhat subjective because you're doing the counting. With a device like the iMed device, it quantifies and objectifies the non-invasive tear breakup time. And once you diagnose tear film instability, or tear film dysregulation. We have products now, something like Tearvia, that we can recommend by one puff in each nostril, BID, to help regulate the kind of stressed tear film. Um, Leslie, have you had an opportunity to use this product yet for your patients? Yes, um, you know, I'm always excited to have new medications and new treatment, and usually um, we have kind of a waiting list of patients ready to try something new. So uh, what I don't have is time, you know, time with patients, but none of us do yet. So I think that I started writing the scripts in December, um, and you know, I don't yet have three months of patients returning. Uh, I did do a lot of one month follow-ups on these patients just to kind of gauge how things were going. And initial response from patients has been overwhelmingly positive that they are not putting another eye drop 
into their eye. Um, so they are welcoming a different delivery mode. Um, I think especially for women who wear makeup during their workday, you know, putting eye drops in throughout the day, they say is, is disruptive. They don't want their makeup to smudge. So they um, are thrilled with that. And also, obviously, the, the adverse events that we see with most of our topical therapies with burning on installation, we don't have that with tear bias. So that's a big win for our patients who've really been intolerant to other medications. But I've, I've used it as um, soul therapy, and I've used it also, obviously, like many of us have as adjunct to patients that are already on chronic um, inflammatory medication, anti-inflammatory medications that we just need something more. And how about and you? It's also great for contact lens wearers because, again, they're limited in the medications that can place in the eye with a contact lens in place. So with a tear via um, going via the nasal pathway, it um, provides them an alternative route. The only negative, and you have to really um, talk to your patients about it, you cannot spray it directly up the nose. You cannot inhale it in. It will make your throat feel uh, uncomfortable and you will cough if you do it incorrectly. So you have to tell your patients, aim it at an angle towards the top of your ears so that, and you hold your breath when you're actually um, uh, spraying it so that you don't inad inadvertently inhale it into your lungs and into your bron bronchial system. Great advice. And also um, sneezing, you know, and, and patients, I actually, at the beginning, because I wanted to make sure that they were doing the right placement of the medication, I would actually have them do that in the office until everybody actually seemed to sneeze initially. So yeah. with COVID and all the protocols that we had in, you know, especially at the beginning of this year um, with some of the surges, I thought maybe this is not the best idea. <laughs> um, so we now, you know, I go over, they have a great um, patient education tool um, in both a handout, that kind of a step-by-step -step explaining all the things that you just explained and also a video that patients can watch so that they're sure to be delivering it right. The feedback I've gotten so far is that the sneezing does get better um, the longer that they're using it, but that's, I mean, not really an adverse event, but something that is good to tell patients just so they're aware of that. And so they don't think they're having an allergic reaction. That's right. right. I tell my patients about the sneezing and about eight, angling the, um, the tip of the bottle in their nostril at that oblique angle. So we're going to pivot from Tiraya neurostimulation to practice management. John wants to know, both of you described your practices before dry eye was a big part of that practice. So how do you track if the dry eye portion of your practice is growing versus other sides of your practice? And uh, Dr. Matosian, do you want to tackle that one first? The one easy way to start looking at that is look at the number of tests, point of care tests, whether it's MMP9 um, or uh, tear osmolarity tests that you're starting to do. Most, but not all, insurance carriers pay for that. And look at the number of cash pay procedures that your patients are paying for and what it's tabulating to in terms of your monthly revenue. Because obviously, the more into dry eye you get, some of the treatment modalities are cash pay, whether it's Blefax or any of these other meibomian gland expression or IPL-like treatments. So that's a great way. In terms of office visits related to dry eye, that's a little bit harder because, of course, we all use the same intermediate or comprehensive new or established codes. So that becomes a little bit harder. But what I did for about a month, every day I would put a DED next to one of those codes on my printed schedule so that I got a feeling that about 80% of my daily encounters had to do with dry eye. So you could do a one week or two week kind of test and then extrapolate that. Great stuff. And Leslie? 
Um, well, metrics are a big part of, you know, a growing practice. So we look at that every month. Um, and really, because we're trying to scale this, we want to see where are we profitable and where are we not. Um, so our system, you know, we actually can track the appointment type. And so I can see if I if I saw you initially as, um, you know, an annual eye exam, that might not count for my dry eye numbers. But then as I see you back, it's called dry eye initial or dry eye follow-up, and I can easily track those. And then we also do track all of our treatments that we're doing um, just to see where we are. It's interesting actually to also see your trends. Now that I have this year of data um, here in this practice, you, you, you see where sometimes you might slow down a little bit with either treatments or your dry eye patients. Um, for me, that was some of the summer months. Um, and, and then as soon as like October hits, that number of patients that are calling you actively seeking things, you know, really picked up. Um, so, you know, it's, it's definitely, I think, important to track. And if I wasn't doing that, because in practices that I had worked previously, we didn't really sit down and look at metrics, I wouldn't know how powerful dry eye was. Um, and now it makes me think about it a whole lot differently to my peers is, again, you can't really afford to not pay attention to it. Um, not only is your patient slowly going to become more symptomatic over years, and then you become this person that, you know, why didn't I know about it sooner? I hear that when I get patients in my door, um, when they have, you know, severe atrophy of glands, when, why has no one told me this? And you don't want to be in that situation either. If you, if you're going to partner with a dry eye specialist, you know, like Cynthia or myself, you know, I will tell you, because we do get a lot of referred patients from other optometrists and even ophthalmologists in our area, your patients thank you. Um, they thank you for the referral. They never think, why didn't you have X, Y, or Z? I hear that all the time. I'm so grateful that my doctor told me about you. And they don't stay with me for other things. They, you know, return to their primary care provider um, for eye care. And, and they just really feel like, wow, I'm so glad they knew that you were this resource in our community. So, you know, if, and, and I refer, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be close enough to um, Wilmer Eye. So I share patients. Um, if I do need my Bomian gland probing, I send patients out the door, you know, for some of my ophthalmology colleagues in, in the dry eye space. So I think it's important just to build those relationships as well. Uh, Kimberly wants to know, what is your preferred omega-3 supplement? Cynthia, do you want to take that one? And I'm so glad you asked that because actually I was going to mention that. One other way to augment and monitor how well you're doing in the dry eye space within your practice is also make products available for patients to purchase as they are leaving the practice, you know, um, after the visit. And these are products like oral omega-3 supplements, heated brood or mass, you know, maybe a preferred artificial tear drop or an ointment, things that you know your patients are going to need on a regular basis. And if you send them out the door and say, go to your nearest cornerstone pharmacy, uh, uh, corner pharmacy and purchase it, they're going to be confused and perhaps end up with the wrong product. By having these products available, then you're not only helping the patient by making the right decision, there's also a little added profit with each sale that goes to your bottom line. With that said, my preferred oral omega-3 supplement is PRN. Those three letters stand for Physician Recommended Nutraceuticals. They are a re-esterified triglyceride version of the omega-3, which provide less GI issues and enhanced absorption. They come in a vegan formula and a liquid formula for those who have trouble swallowing and in regular capsules. And also now in a pediatric version, which has been a huge addition because, um, as you know, we're seeing a lot of meibomian gland in our, you know, youth population as well. Matthew wants to know, do you have any experience with RF or radiofrequency treatments for dry eye MGD, Leslie? I have, I have limited experience, but a few years ago, um, a company did bring it in. Uh, and it's definitely something I have my eye on. Um, 
it is on my wish list for, you know, when I have a little bit more resources to acquire new technology. Um, I'm really excited to see how it is improving. It makes sense to me if it's able to um, improve lid dynamics by tightening, the, um, increasing collagen turnover, tightening the skin. You know, a lot of patients blink dynamics seem to be part of the reason for meibomian gland stasis. And, you know, up until the introduction of radio frequency, maybe I get some gain with IPL, but um, I was thinking a lot of times of surgical referrals, right, in those patients. And so this is has the potential to maybe give the patient a non-surgical approach to improving that um, lid dynamics. And I think it's um, definitely something to consider. Uh, we will pivot to biologics um, with Regenerize and Stimulize being the topic here. So in patients with systemic inflammatory conditions, is there any concern about the presence of inflammatory mediators in the bloodstream that would render autologous serum a poor treatment choice in these patients? And would you rather use a biologic like Regenerize or Stimulize in that particular case? Dr. Matosian, do you have any experience with those biologics? I do, and they play a really critical role in my practice. I use Regenerize a lot. I don't have personal experience with Stimulize. And these are patients who are already on, let's say, intermittent steroids for their flare-ups. They're already on an uh, immunomodulator, which they swear they're taking BID. They're already on oral supplements and have undergone other in office procedures and their surface is still stressed. They do really well with the biologics. I start with something like Regenerize and it comes in two strengths, pro and light. And light is L-I-T-E. I start with a pro and you can use it two to four times a day. It is directly shipped to the patient, cold, and they have to keep it refrigerated. Whereas the light version, once you open it, you can leave it out for the duration of that vial. You cannot do so for the pro. And I use that before I go to serum tears. It's simpler for the patients. They don't have to go to a lab, have the blood drawn. We can't make serum tears in our practice because we don't have um, the capacity to do that. So I would say, give it a try. For your patients who need that extra oomph before you go to serum tears, it's a great alternative. Leslie, in those patients that are, something's going on systemically, does that change your treatment choice between serum tears or PRP versus something like amniotic fluid drops, whether that's regenerized or stimulized? I do think that you have to think about those inflammatory conditions. Um, I am seeing a lot of good come from PRP addition, you know, to these eye drops. So I think that uh, I do have Regenerize experience as well. Um, and I, I agree with what Cynthia is saying. I think it's a good first step in. And then if you're not getting where you need to be, consider that. Or if you feel concerned about that inflammatory state of the patient, I mean, I think you could start if you were headed toward autologous serum and you had concerns about it, you're, you know, what would happen? I feel like would the patient really get worse? They just might not get better, right? If they're, if what inflammation is in their body, it, 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 I think you would know if you needed to change gears. So I don't think you could go wrong by doing it in a patient that maybe has more inflammatory cytokines, um, but it's nice to have Regenerize um, in that pro and light form. And it definitely has been, you know, an ad, a great addition for patients and easier. I also have been using vital tears because I too can't do serum tears in my practice, but um, it does make it a little bit easier for me to get patients on that therapy. So this may and fall into the same category. Um, re recommendations for persistent SPK despite extensive treatments. And I think certainly biologics are part of that, but what is missing in your treatment if someone has SPK, has stating that you think is due to dry eye and they're just not getting better, it's recalcitrant. What are your next steps there, Cynthia? Two things, two very important things. One, I try Procara Slim and put the self-retaining amniotic bandage contact lens in their eye and monitor them. And then sometimes what I do 
if there's still a little bit of SPK after I remove the ring, is place them on something like Regenerize as a step-down therapy. The other thing is you have to have your radar go up on patients like this and do corneal sensitivity testing. Most of the time, these are patients who are demonstrating some early stage one neurotrophic keratitis. And I do the cotton tip, you know, I make a little wisp and I touch it. I don't have an esthesiometer in our practice. I don't use that, but just the cotton tip. And I'm amazed at how many times there is corneal decreased sensitivity, one eye sometimes more than the other. And then of course, these are patients who do very, very well on Oxervate. It's a six times a day, eight week course. You really have to prepare your patients. There is some paperwork that has to be done, but boy, do they really benefit from this nerve growth regenerating product. Leslie, any other thoughts there? No, I, I think Oxervate is a great, another great addition to our um, toolbox for dry eye. Um, I agree on the corneal sensitivity testing as well. Um, so uh, I don't, I don't think I have anything more to add there. We've got oh, uh, scleral lenses. Actually, is what I was lenses, yeah. it's out of my head. Scleral lenses, but for me, I actually been using scleral lenses as that, you know, that patient that does have this SBK that even after all of these things, I'm not clearing because in my experience, just with my own patients, they're still a trickier scleral lens patient because they have more awareness of their eye just in general. But I mean, th that goes back to, you know, the days of me learning about MGD from Dr. Korb. He, you know, was saying, if you have no meibomian glands and you can't treat, you know, you, you should be thinking scleral lens. So, I mean, that's going back 10, 12 years ago now. We and have two more, minutes, this, two more minutes, sorry. two more questions. Um, okay. Cynthia, final thought on that. Well, the scleral lens in that vault, you can put Regenerize in. And for my patients with bad SPK, that's a great combination. So if you have a patient that you are planning to do thermal pulsation and IPL, which of those do you do first? How many sessions of IPL? Um, Cynthia, what does that look like in your typical patient thermal pulsation plus IPL as far as their treatment schedule? And that is not an uncommon combination at all. And actually, in my personal opinion, they work beautifully together because the mode of action in each one is different. I personally start with the Lipoflow first. I heat and evacuate the inspissated glands to kind of clear them out while concomitantly they are doing oral omega-3 PRN. They're doing the brooder heated mass. They're doing lid scrubs if warranted. Then they come back maybe a month later, six weeks later, and I do a series of four for the IPL, intense pulse light, because now we are attacking inflammation periorbitally and you Usually these patients do extremely well. Leslie, anything different uh, in your practice? I would say just sometimes I might flip it and do IPL first. If I see a lot of ocular rosacea or telangiectasia there, um, just in my experience, getting rid of some of those vessels really helps then the clearing of the obstruction. But in most cases, I would agree that clearing the obstruction first and then tackling inflammation is a good, uh, good way to go. Final question, quick answer here. What is your go-to artificial tear, Dr. Matosian? <laughs> wow, that's a million dollar question. It depends on, again, there's no simple answer. You have to see what's going on. There are tears. Number one, it, it has to be preservative free. You don't want to add any other chemicals to the surface. So my goal, even if they use it once a day, is do preservative free. But then there are many options and there are ones with hyaluronic acid, with omega-3s, all to be considered depending on what's going on with the surface. Leslie, any go-to teardrop for your typical dry eye disease patient? 
you know, I do think that is a difficult question. I would agree with Cynthia. Um, the other addition has really been looking at the glycerin-based tears too. So I usually gauge it on what type of dry eye I'm treating. If I want to be recommending a lipid tear or, or symptoms, you know, if my patient's telling me certain things about morning symptoms or all day symptoms or end of the day symptoms, that kind of helps me gauge what type of tear supplementation I want, whether it's a more viscous tear in the evening or a lipid-based tear for that mid-afternoon or the HA drops are great when my patients are just complaining about all day, you know, everyday symptoms. So fantastic session, Dr. Matosi and Dr. Odell. Thank you so much. I do have a bonus raffle code. It is aqueous, A-Q-U-E-O-U-S. Aqueous is your bonus raffle code. We have 15 minutes till our next session, creating the dry eye environment in your practice. Go to the conference bag, click donate. So Eyes on Eye Care can donate $1 on your behalf to the Sjogren's Foundation. Go visit the exhibit hall. I'll see you back here in the implementation track soon. Excellent session, had a lot of fun here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much.